Thea Cleo. I've decided to stop my own garden, but have no idea where to begin. Could you give me some advice on how to plant a garden? Confused but hopeful. Dear Confused but Hopeful, Oh, planting a garden is like making a big salad in the ground. First, you need some soil. That's the stuff under your feet that isn't floor or carpet. I once tried to plant on my living room floor, and let me tell you, the plants didn't appreciate it. Next, you need seeds. Seeds are like baby plants that haven't grown up yet. I suggest singing lullabies to them. They grow up to be strong and happy that way. Don't forget to give them water. Plants are like little green sponges. You don't want to drown them, though. Just imagine you're giving them tiny sips of tea. Now, you have to find a good spot for your garden. It should be sunny but not too sunny, like a panda with a sun hat. If it's too shady, you might grow mushrooms instead. I once planted carrots in the shade, and they turned into mushrooms. Very confusing. Don't forget to talk to your plants. They get lonely otherwise. I always tell my plants about my day. They never respond, but I'm sure they're great listeners. Just don't expect them to give advice back. I learned that the hard way. And finally, keep an eye out for pests. They're like uninvited guests to a picnic. If you see a bug, politely ask it to leave. If it doesn't, you might need to call in reinforcements, like a ladybug squad. So there you have it, Sarah. Happy gardening. And remember, a garden is just a salad waiting to happen. Fuzzily yours. Cleo, are you looking for some advice? Email me your question at beastlybanterblog at gmail.com. Confused about when to plant what? The Plant Whisperer app, endorsed by Cleo, tells you exactly when to sow, water, and nurture your plants. No misinterpretations here, we promise. Get your hands dirty with Fuzzily Yours Gardening Gloves. Sturdy enough to handle the thorniest of plants, yet soft enough for even the fluffiest gardeners. Planting made easy for every fuzzy friend. Want to grow bamboo like Cleo? The Grow Your Own Bamboo Kit provides everything you need to create a lush, panda-friendly garden. Fast growing and perfect for anyone who loves a zen-like vibe. Are you always misinterpreting your seed packets? Try confusing free seed packets. Designed by Cleo. Clear labels, simple instructions, and a guarantee that you won't mistake a tomato plant for a weed. Hey Groovy Readers! Welcome back to another edition of Hippo Chicks Grooves where we dive deep into the world of music and find the hottest tracks, the coolest albums, and the grooviest beats to keep your toes tapping and your ears happy. This week, we're cranking up the volume and strapping in for a wild ride with a rock and roll classic that's as epic as a hippo on a tightrope. Trust me, I've thought about it. Meatloaf's Bad Outta Hell. The Album, a theatrical rock extravaganza. Released in 1977, Bad Outta Hell is the brainchild of Meatloaf and composer Jim Steinman. This album is a rock opera that blends bombastic anthems, sweeping ballads, and more motorcycle metaphors than a Hell's Angel convention. From the title track to the epic Paradise by the Dashboard Light, every song is a larger-than-life experience. The music, soaring vocals and wicked guitars. Let's talk about the music. Meatloaf's voice is like a tidal wave, powerful, unstoppable, and capable of washing away all your worries. The opening track, Bat Out of Hell, is a nine minute roller coaster of searing guitars, thunderous drums, and vocals that could wake the dead. It's the kind of song that makes you want to don a leather jacket and ride a motorcycle into the sunset even if you're a hippo who prefers the comfort of a nice, roomy river. Paradise by the Dashboard Light is a rock and roll saga all on its own, featuring a play-by-play -play baseball commentary, because why not? It's a duet with Ellen Foley, 
that's all about youthful passion and regret. It's like watching a soap opera set to music, but with more guitars and fewer commercial breaks. The Impact, a timeless classic. Bad Out of Hell wasn't just an album, it was a phenomenon. It sold over 50 million copies worldwide and cemented Meatloaf's place in rock history. It's been turned into a stage musical, and its songs have been covered by countless artists. It's the kind of al album that your parents played at full volume and that you'll want to pass down to your kids, or in my case, my fellow hippos. Final Thoughts, a must listen. If you haven't listened to Bat Out of Hell yet, what are you waiting for? It's a rock masterpiece that combines theatrical flair with raw musical talent. Whether you're a fan of classic rock, epic ballads, or just looking for something to blast while you practice your tightrope walking. Wish me luck. This album is a must-have. Until next time, keep your music playing and never stop dreaming. Chick. Make your vinyl records sound as good as the day they were pressed with Hippo Harmony's Vinyl Cleaner. Your copy of Bat Out of Hell will be as clean and ready to rock just like Chick demands. Get the soaring theatrical sound of Bat Out of Hell with the euphoric echo guitar pedal. Perfect for recreating the epic rock anthems that Chick grooves to. This pedal will turn every strum into a... Experience Metallica like never before with Headbangers Headphones. These headphones deliver earth-shattering bass and sound so clear, it's like being at a concert in your own home. Rock on with Chick-approved gear. Take on the world like a rock star with Chick's Rock Ready Sunglasses. These shades give you that cool, dark, brooding look perfect for air guitaring to bat out of hell. Well, Rex, we started our journey through AFI's Top 10 Western Movies. First on the list, sitting at number 10, is Cat Baloo. This film is a bit of an oddball, a western comedy from 1965. A western that tries to be funny. Now I've seen everything. <laughs> Laughter is the thun that drives winter from the human faith. Capaloo is a delightful blend of humor and western action. It stars Jane Fonda as Catherine Capaloo, a schoolteacher turned outlaw, seeking revenge for her father's murder. With Lee Marvin playing dual roles as the drunken gun gunslinger Kid Shaleen and the villainous Tim Strawn, the film masterfully combines slapstick comedy with the classic western revenge tale. You call it masterful, I call it a mess. I can't say I'm a fan of mixing comedy with the grid of the Wild West. Lee Marvin's Kid Shaleen is about as useful as a screen door in a submarine. And that Cat Baloo? She's got spunk, I'll give her that. But the whole plot feels like it was cooked up by someone who's never set foot in the real West. Variety is the spice of life that gives it all its flavor. Cat Baloo takes a unique approach to the Western genre using humor to highlight the absurdity and harsh realities of life in the Old West. The film also features Nat King Cole and Stubby K as wandering minstrels who narrate the story through song, adding a whimsical touch that sets it apart from traditional westerns. Whimsical touch? More like a distraction. But I'll admit, Marvin did a bang-up job, even won an Oscar for it. Playing two characters who are as different as night and day takes real talent. The historical aspect of the film, though, was pretty loose. They took plenty of liberties with what really went down in the West. Back in the 60s, folks liked their westerns with a side of fantasy, I suppose. Every artist was first an amateur. Capaloo reflects the cultural shift of the 1960s, combining traditional western elements with contemporary sensibilities and a growing appetite for more diverse and innovative storytelling. It's a film that doesn't take itself too seriously, but still delivers a powerful message about justice and resilience. Justice and resilience, huh? 
If you say so, to me it's just another reminder that Hollywood has a knack of twisting the truth. But I reckon if you like your westerns with a side of silliness, you might enjoy Cat Blue. It's got some good laughs and a decent story if you don't mind the historical inaccuracies. To each his own, Capaloo is a charming, offbeat western that offers a fresh take on the genre. It's a film that entertains while subtly critiquing the myths of the old west. Defiantly worth a watch for those who appreciate the good laugh with their cowboy tale. Well, there you have it. Our first dive into the AFI's top westerns. If you ask me, I'd rather stick to the classics without all the frills, but that's just this old cowboy's opinion. All's well that ends well. Until next time, keep your hats on and your remotes ready. See you at the movies. To buy your own copy of the movie and to support this channel, click below. Do you have a movie list that you think Duke and Rex should review? Email us your suggestion at beastlybanterblog at gmail.com. Transform into the characters of Cat Blue with our Old West costume kits, featuring hats, boots, and costumes straight out of the movie, perfect for those who love a little Hollywood nostalgia. Tired of losing your hat like Duke? Try Rex's Hat Finder GPS. Never misplace your hat again while watching westerns or during your own western escapades. Keep your hats on and your remotes ready. Sing along to the classics with Cat Blue Karaoke Night. This kit includes all your favorite songs from the movie, a microphone, and a mini horse-shaped stage prop for added flair. Bring Hollywood home. Join the Curmudgeons Western Movie Club today. With Cat Blue as our feature film, you'll get exclusive access to behind-the-scenes footage and Duke's cranky commentary, perfect for any movie lover. Hello spice lovers and insatiable eaters, Acorn here alongside my ever hungry partner Woody, ready to take you on another flavor packed journey around the world. This week we've set our sights on a classic Korean comfort food that promises to warm your soul and set your taste buds ablaze, kimchi jjigae. History behind the heat. Kimchi jjigae, or kimchi stew, is a beloved staple in Korean cuisine. Celebrated for its hearty, spicy, and slightly tangy flavors, the star ingredient kimchi is fermented vegetables, usually Napa cabbage, seasoned with chili pepper, garlic, ginger, and other spices. This dish has roots that stretch back centuries, with kimchi itself being an essential part of Korean culture since the Three Kingdoms period which was 57 BC to 668 AD. Kimchi jjigae likely became popular during the Joseon Dynasty, 1392 to 1910, as a way to make use of over-fermented kimchi and leftovers, creating a rich, flavorful stew that could feed the whole family. Ingredients that pack a punch. The beauty of kimchi jjigae lies in its simplicity and flexibility. The essential components include aged kimchi, pork or tofu for a vegetarian twist, gochujang, Korean chili paste, garlic, onion, and scallions. The stew is often enriched with additional vegetables, mushrooms, and sometimes seafood all simmered together until the flavors meld into a delightful spicy harmony. Cooking up the perfect storm. Saute the aromatics. Start by sauteing garlic and onions in a hot pot until fragrant. Add thinly sliced pork and cook until browned. Then add the kimchi. Toss in a generous amount of kimchi and stir fry for a few minutes. This helps to release the flavors and soften the kimchi. Pour on water or broth and add a spoonful of gochujang for that signature spicy kick. Let it all simmer until the flavors meld beautifully. Then, finish with tofu and veggies. Add chunks of tofu and any additional veggies you like, simmering until everything is tender and flavorful. Heat writing, a fiery feast. Now let's talk about the heat level. On our patented hot and hungry Scoville Snarlometer, we'd rate kimchi jjigae as a solid three out of five roars. The heat is present but manageable, building slowly and each bite and balanced by the tanginess of the fermented kimchi. 
It's the kind of dish that warms you from the inside out, perfect for cold days or when you're in need of a spicy pick-me-up. Final thoughts. Kimchi jjigae is more than just a stew. It's a cultural experience in a bowl. Each spoonful tells the story of tradition, community, and the undeniable love Koreans have for their beloved kimchi. Whether you're a spice novice or a seasoned chili head, this dish is a must-try on your culinary adventures. Make it at home. To enjoy your homemade kimchi jjigae, it's a flavorful dish that's perfect for warming up on chilly days. Just follow the directions below. Until next time, stay hot and hungry. Acorn and Woody. Do you have a spicy food that you think Acorn and Woody should try? Email us your suggestion at beastlybanterblog at gmail.com. Are you wondering if your kimchi jjigae is hot enough for Acorn and Woody? Use the hot sauce thermometer to gauge the heat. It's a must-have for those who like their food fiery and their mouths watering. Master the art of making kimchi jjigae with the Kimchi King Cooking Kit. Comes with all the essential spices and tools to create a stew spicy enough to please Acorn and Woody's discerning taste buds. Do you love the burn of kimchi jjigae? Let it do double duty as a spicy facial. The spicy steam face fauna is inspired by the steamy goodness of Korean stew, soothing your skin while satisfying your hunger. Keep your kimchi fresh and your fridge smelling clean with the kimchi jar storage system. Perfect for home chefs who love spicy dishes but hate lingering odors. Acorn and Woody approved. Dear Cupcake, My spouse and I argue about our money. Is it wrong for me to tell my spouse what our financial advisor says about every single thing? Sincerely, Conflicted Cash Cow. Dear Conflicted Cash Cow, First off, let me just say that money moves and marital movements can be real headache, even more so than a broken electric guitar string during a heavy metal solo. When it comes to sharing every single piece of advice from your financial advisor with your spouse, think of it like this. Just because you know how to make a five-layer grass lasagna doesn't mean you need to tell your spouse every single blade of grass that went into it. Sometimes, it's okay to keep things simple and focus on the big picture. Imagine Mrs. Fluffypuss, my precious kitty. If she reported back to me every time she saw a bird outside the window, I'd never get a moment's peace. Similarly, your spouse might appreciate the key takeaways without getting bogged down in the nitty gritty details. Here's a wild idea from a cow who's seen it all and won the lottery. Why not mix it up? Next time you have a financial meeting, take your spouse along for the ride. It's like a heavy metal concert. You both need to feel the bass to truly get into the groove. Share the highlights and game-changing advice, but leave out the minute-by-minute -minute play of every stock tip and the interest rate fluctuation. And hey... If things get too tense, just crank up some heavy metal. Nothing says let's cool off like a bit of head banging together. Who knew budgeting and Black Sabbath could go hand in hand? So no, it's not wrong to share what your financial advisor says, but do it in moderation, like hot sauce on a Sunday. A little goes a long way. Stay grazing and amazing, Cupcake. Do you have a financial question for Cupcake to try and answer? Email us your suggestion at beastlybantablog at gmail.com. Need to jot down a few notes that your spouse doesn't need to know about? Cupcake's Secret Savings Journal is the perfect place to keep track of forgotten financial details. Stay grazing and amazing discreetly. Wondering if you should spill the beans or keep quiet? Use the financial honesty meter to help you decide how much to tell your spouse. It's like a lie detector, but for finances. Get ready to face the music with Cupcake's Moolah Mask. It gives you a calm, collected look for those tough financial conversations. Because if you look confident, 
you'll feel confident. Transform your financial discussions with the Budgeting Without Bickering Guide. Learn how to keep the peace while discussing even the most stressful money matters. Cupcake recommends it, though she might not always use it. Hey the ice aficionados, Sugar here, ready to take you on a slick ride through the exhilarating history of short track speed skating. Grab your skates and your favorite ice cold beverage, because this story is refreshing as a dip in the Arctic Ocean. The birth of a speedy sport. Short track speed skating, often referred to as the Formula One on ice, zoomed into the sports scene in the early 20th century. Unlike its long track cousin, short track packs all the thrills and spills in an oval rink that's only 111.12 meters long. That means skaters have to navigate tight turns and high speeds, making every race a nail biter. The origins of this icy sprint date back to the 1900s when North America and Europe were looking for new ways to challenge the laws of physics and apparently test their life insurance policies. Early days when crashes were cool. The first official short track competitions began in the 1900s, but it wasn't until the 1970s that the sport gained traction. Canada and the United States were at the forefront hosting informal meets that often ended with skaters in tangled heaps. Spectators loved it. Who doesn't enjoy a good crash? It was like watching bumper cars, but on skates. Short track speed skating made its Olympic debut as a demonstration sport in the 1988 Calgary Winter Games. It was such a hit that it earned full medal status by the 1992 Albertville Winter Olympics. Since then, it's become a fan favorite known for its unpredictable nature. One moment you're leading the pack, the next you're on the ice wondering what just happened. It's a sport where anything can happen and usually does. The rules, or how to survive the chaos. In short track, races range from 500 meters to 1500 meters with multiple skaters on the ice simultaneously. The strategy is key, finding the perfect moment to make the move while avoiding a pileup. Disqualifications are common, often due to impeding, or as I like to call it, creative hugging. It's a sport that rewards both speed and savvy with a side of bravery or insanity. Legends on Ice Over the years, Short Trek has produced some legendary skaters, names like Apollo Ono from the USA with his signature soul patch and unmatched agility, and South Korea's Victor Ahn who switched nationalities and continued to dominate, are etched in the icy annals of history. These athletes have inspired countless others to don their skates and hit the rink, dreaming of a Olympic glory. Fun Fact The Ice Puzzle Did you know that the ice temperature for short track speed skating is kept between negative 5.5 Celsius and 6 degrees Celsius? This ensures the perfect balance between glide and grip. Too warm and the ice gets slushy, too cold and it's like skating on sandpaper. Maintaining this frosty equilibrium is an art in itself, making the ice a crucial player in every race. Final lap. So there you have it, a whirlwind tour through the chilly, thrilling world of short track speed skating. It's a sport where milliseconds count, strategies are hatched on the fly, and the ice is unpredictable as the weather in the Arctic. If you haven't yet, give it a watch. You might just find yourself hooked. Until next time, stay frosty, my friends. Sugar. Do you have a cold weather sport for sugar to research? Email us your suggestion at beastlybanterblog at gmail.com. Want to race like a polar bear on ice? Polar speed skates are built for agility, speed, and keeping cool under pressure. Get yours today and take the plunge into the short track racing. Stay safe like sugar with worry-free ice protection pads. Perfect for avoiding those speed racing collisions. These pads will keep you feeling confident as you glide around the track. Need a burst of energy to keep up with short track speed racers? 
Try Frosty Finish Energy Gel. It's designed to cool you down while giving you the fuel that you need to finish first. Stay safe and stylish on the ice with the Polar Plunge Racing Helmet. Designed for speed racing and endorsed by Sugar, it's got both style and safety covered. Slide into first place. Hello, history buffs and curious minds. It's time for another rollicking ride through the weird and wonderful moments of yesteryear with Pim's Peculiar Past. Today we're wading into the one of the smelliest chapters in history, the Great Stink of 1858. Hold your noses and join me as we dive into the murky waters of Victorian London. The Smell of Progress Picture it, London in the mid-19th century. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing and the city was bustling with innovation and growth. Unfortunately, it was also bursting at the seams with something far less pleasant, human waste. With a population explosion and no proper sewage system, the River Thames had become a giant open sewer. And let me tell you, it was not a pleasant sight or smell. The heat is on. The summer of 1858 was particularly hot and as the temperature rose, so did the stench. The river's filth was baking in the sun, creating a miasma that engulfed the city. People gagged, horses fainted, and politicians had to soak their curtains in chloride of lime to mask the odor. It was the old factory equivalent of a horror movie. Parliament in Peril The Great Stink reached its pungent peak in June 1858, and it was so overpowering that it threatened to shut down the British government. Members of Parliament were suffering in the riverside chambers, desperately trying to conduct business while fighting the urge to vomit. Something had to be done, and fast. Enter the Sanitary Saviors Enter Joseph Bazalgette, the hero we didn't know we needed but definitely deserved. Bazalgette was a civil engineer with a vision and presumably a strong stomach. He proposed an ambitious plan to build a network of sewers that would divert waste away from the Thames and out to the sea. It was a massive undertaking, but the alternative, continued old factory assault, was unthinkable. A Stinky Solution with the stink reaching critical levels, Parliament quickly passed the necessary legislation and Basil Goethe got to work. He designed and constructed over 1,100 miles of underground brick sewers, which transported waste far from the city. The system was completed in 1875 and is still in use today. Talk about a lasting legacy. The Sweet Smell of Success once the new sewer system was in place, the great stink became a thing of the past. The air cleared and the Thames began to recover, and Londoners could breathe easy once more. Basil Goethe's work not only solved the immediate problem, but also paved the way for modern urban sanitation, improving public health and reducing the spread of disease like cholera. Lessons Learned the Great Stink of 1858 serves as a pungent reminder of the importance of proper sanitation and infrastructure. It's a story of how a city on the brink of collapse and nasal disaster turned things around with ingenuity and determination. Plus, it gives us a reason to be grateful for modern plumbing. So there you have it, the tale of how London went from stinky to sparkling, thanks to the genius of Joseph Basal Goethe and a little legislative urgency. Until next time, keep your history clean and your noses clear. Stay curious. Pim Do you have an unusual piece of history for Pim to research? Email us your suggestions at beastlybanterblog at gmail.com Travel back to 1858 without the smell. Pim's scent be gone candles banish foul odors, giving you peace of mind as you learn about the stinkiest moments in history. Take a plunge into the past with the sewer safari walking tours. Discover the great stink of 1858 in London's underground tunnels. Just make sure to bring a nose plug. 
Measure the stench in your own home with PIM's Odorometer Home Test Kit, based on the technology from 1858. This kit helps you identify any great stink level smells before they take over. Tired of smelling bad history? Freshen up with Fresh Air Cologne, inspired by the solution to London's great stink. PIM approved for anyone who appreciates both cleanliness and history. 